in 2020, we had the election on, I think the election was called on November 7th. So they had about two and a half months with which to respond in violence. This time we have primaries, we have conventions, we have the vote itself, we have all those other dates like January 6th. Perhaps even more seriously though, we have court dates and the court dates are being used to fuel this narrative of victimhood and martyrdom that extremists thrive off. And so I think we're in a worse situation than we were in, in 2020 and 2021. I'm Catherine Pompilio, Associate Editor of Lawfare, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, February 13th, 2024. Unfortunately, Americans are not strangers to far-right terrorism. From the 2015 mass murder at a historic black church in Charleston, to the 2017 Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, to the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol, these horrific incidents are only the latest in a decades-long process in which harmful conspiracy theories, radical ideologies, and hostility toward government come together to form a grave and increasing threat to democracy. In their book, God, Guns, and Sedition, Far-Right Terrorism in America, Bruce Hoffman and Jacob Ware tell the story of the rise of far-right terrorism and explain how to counter it. I sat down with Hoffman and Ware to unpack their book. We discussed the historical trajectory of violent right-wing extremism, Donald Trump's effect on these groups and the threat of far-right extremism heading into the 2024 election, how to address the issue, and more. It's the Lawfare Podcast, February 13th, 2024. God, Guns, and Sedition with Bruce Hoffman and Jacob Ware. We're talking about your book, God, Guns, and Sedition, Far-Right Terrorism in America. So to get those who haven't read it situated, what is your elevator pitch for this book? What is the book about? I would say the argument of the book or the theme is that what we saw on January 6, 2021 uh, was not an endpoint or a culmination but rather part of at least a 40-year-long trajectory. What made you want to write this book? Gosh, well, that's that's actually not such an easy question. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a little bit complex, but I think the simplest answer is that both Jacob and I were horrified that when we had the COVID lockdown in March 2020, literally within days of the world shutting down, the worst kinds of anti-Semitic tropes and memes and messages were appearing on social media. And then very rapidly it spread from sort of the demonization of Jews and their intent to profit from this terrible uh, tragedy that had befallen the, the world. It spread to blaming Asians and Asian Americans for spreading this disease. It then turned on ostracizing and actually weaponizing the disease to attack persons of color in supermarkets and pharmacies, because that was basically the only places that anybody was out and about. And we just got very concerned that's that it was very clear that social media was having a highly corrosive, if not poisonous, effect on empowering and, and really hypersonically uh, powering as well uh, the, worst, the worst aspects of social media. And we also thought that there were a lot of parallels to the 1980s, and that's really the trajectory of the book. We do talk about, of course, uh, the emergence of the Ku Klux Klan after the Civil War during the Reconstruction period, the second coming of the Klan in the 19-teens and 1920s. These are enormously important uh, watersheds, the 1960s and the rise of the Klan again in response to the Civil Rights Movement. But we really thought that there was a parallel to the 1980s in that Back then and in 2020 and even today, the United States was coming off of multiple decades involvement in overseas military expeditions that hadn't gone entirely well, and it created a lot of discontent and dis dissension in the United States. Then, as now, the United States was in some economic problems, or at least uh, face some economic challenges. Of course, in the 1980s, it was double-digit inflation, but in 2020, it was just the whole uncertainty of how the econ global economy would be knocked sideways by COVID. That these two factors were generating a new form of xenophobia that centered on a very strident 
anti-immigrant discourse back in the 1980s and again in 2020 and beyond. And we thought that all these parallels made it worthwhile to trace this trajectory and show that the lack of faith and trust in elected officials, anti-government extremism, sentiments of sedition had surfaced once before. And to you know, sort of map that um, map map that background, but also show how it was very different now and how it's becoming much more dangerous because of uh, social media. I'll say one other thing on on this is that 43 years ago, I began my career as an analyst, and my first account, as it were, was violent far right extremism in Europe, and that was in 1981. And within a few years, I was. Similarly focused on violent far-right extremism in the United States, and had studied it uh, very intently throughout the 1980s and 1990s. One of the last things I ever thought in 2020 or in the 21st century is I would be returning, as it were, to my roots. But because of these strong parallels, it resonated with me, not just historically, from an analytical perspective, but from a very personal perspective. So that was the other reason that we decided to write the book. Yeah. Before we we really dive in, this book is so extensively researched. And I loved the structure of, you know, you're, you're kind of addressing these main themes, but it, they are also paired with one, two, or three certain flashpoints or examples that kind of encapsulate everything that you're talking about chapter by chapter. But walk me through your writing process. How long did it take you? What was the research process for this like? Well, I'll jump in first, uh, just because this is exactly a sub- question I love answering. Um <laughs> We started it during COVID, which meant we really couldn't do a lot of traveling. So it was remarkable how much primary source. I mean, I was trained as a historian many decades ago. It was remarkable how much primary source information, when you really dig, you can find. So that was part of it. Obviously, I mean, as the older of the two, it's fascinating to write a book with someone when there's a 41-year age difference. You have two very unique perspectives. Uh, we worked extraordinarily well together. I don't think I'll ever be able to replicate such a great writing experience as I had with, with Jacob. I took the more historical part. I mean, because I'm older and I'm old, but also because I knew that so well, because I had studied it so intently and I never thought I would write a book about it. And Jacob took the the more modern part. And then, of course, we exchanged chapters. Originally, it was going to be a very different book. Originally, it was going to be much more of a social science book. We were going to have thematic chapters on infiltration of the military and law enforcement, a chapter on social media, one chapter just on historical background. And it was fascinating because after working on this for two or three months, I said to Jacob, we've got to change our approach. This is really an historical book because I was charged with writing that introductory chapter. And literally it was becoming, I was already well into the second chapter. And I don't think I'd gotten to 1984 yet. So <laughs> 1985. So we changed uh, approaches. It took us two years to write. Um, and again, we would finish things and constantly exchange them and rewrite one another's material. Then around July 2022, two university presses were interested in it. And then it went through four peer reviews, basically two anonymous peer reviews per press. We responded to both of those. So we were rewriting it yet again. And then it got accepted uh, by both, but we ended up going with Columbia University Press. And then we submitted it to our employer, the Council on Foreign Relations, and it went through very intense internal reviews that were really excellent, that not only caught things that some of the academic reviews didn't, but also, as one would expect from the Council on Foreign Relations, really pushed us very hard uh, to sharpen our policy recommendations. So it went through a lot of rewrites. And then we made the decision because of this process of, of doing these rewrites, it meant that the book wouldn't have been published until towards the end of 2023. And we thought, really, what's the point? We should wait and hold it both for the third anniversary of the January 6, 2021 insurrection at the U.S. Capitol and also for the start of the U.S. presidential campaign. I'll add that I'm probably the more pessimistic of the two of us. Having studied terrorism for nearly 50 years now, that does not create a wellspring of optimism about the world. But even in the depths of my pessimism, I thought by the time it was published, maybe I was secretly hoping that it would be overtaken by events and might not be as topical as it is right now. But of course, we find it extremely topical. Absolutely. 
So yeah, let's let's get into it. The book explains the accelerationism of far right terrorism broadly. What is accelerationism in this context, and how does it relate to the book? Well, accelerationism is a strategy of terrorism and violent extremism that basically says society is so corrupt and so broken that the only solution is actually to collapse the whole thing. And so these extremists call for acts of violence that are going to accelerate that revolution, that apocalypse. We trace this strategy back to a book that was published in 1978 called The Turner Diaries, which was and remains a blueprint or a model for really far-right terroristic revolution in the United States. It ends with a race war um, in which the white supremacist side is triumphant. Acceleration has actually existed in Marxist doctrine too, and we see it today. Our cover of the book shows a, hallows, a gallows and a hangman's noose erected outside the US Capitol on January 6th uh, in reference to something called the Day of the Rope. And the Day of the Rope, again, it's straight out of the Turner Diaries. It was the day that all the race traitors uh, were going to be rounded up and executed by, by the order, which was the group in the Turner Diaries. And so accelerationism remains a, a very important theme, a very important trend in the modern movement. But as, as Bruce already outlined in the introduction uh, or in our elevator pitch, we find that uh, even though this strategy played such a big role on January 6th and played such a big role in some of the other acts of violence that we've seen, like the Buffalo supermarket shooting in 2022 or the Christchurch mock shooting in 2019, it actually can be traced back 46 years to, that, to the publication of that book in 1978. Yeah, I was going to ask about the Turner Diaries. Um, and just for clarity, what story does the book tell? And as you've put it, what is the battle plan that it lays out? Well, the book was written by someone named William uh, Luther Pierce, um, who used the pseudonym Andrew McDonald. Now, Pierce was an interesting uh, character. Uh, he studied at Caltech, so he was not uh, a stupid man. He eventually got a, his undergraduate degree and his PhD in physics. He also led the National Alliance, which was... Uh, neo-Nazi organization in the United States based just outside of Washington, D.C. And, and Alexandria. But interestingly, he understood that the kind of didactic, turgid, endless repetitions of Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf only had a limited audience. And therefore, he hit on the idea of instead of, or in addition to his kind of staple of, of, of hate and intolerant propaganda, to write a novel, to write fiction, to b draw people into the movement. And it actually succeeded. I mean, the Turner Diaries uh, was widely available. You could purchase it on Amazon up until about a week after the January 6, 2021 attacks. It's a, it's a dystopian novel. It tells the story of a terrorist group called The Order that sets about to overthrow the government of the United States. It very much channels, as Jacob just described, um, accelerationist uh, ideology and strategy, including the day of the rope, uh, which was depicted on our cover on and in real life occurred on January 6th. And it has become for many, uh, as you know, life sometimes imitates art, it has become a blueprint for many terrorists. I mean, there was a real life group that called itself the order that was active in 1983 and 1984 and sought to implement the Turner Diaries. There was a successor group that called itself the Silent Brotherhood that again, tried to implement the Turner Diaries. And then the most infamous manifestation of it was Timothy McVeigh, a U.S. Army veteran who blew up the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Office Building in Oklahoma City on April 19th, 1995, killing 168 persons until the September 11th, 2001 uh, attacks. That was the most lethal terrorist incident in the history of the United States. And McVeigh was arrested uh, within hours of blowing up the building by an Oklahoma state trooper. And next to him on the front seat of his car, um, he had a folder. And in the folder were pages from the Turner Diaries that he had cut out because they were so important and meaningful to him that he had underlined and highlighted and, note, and, 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 and taken notes on. And it was basically his inspiration. So the, the book 
tells the story as well of kind of the revival of the KKK at the start of the 20th century. But in a broader sense, uh, how does white supremacy fit into the narrative of right-wing terrorist movements? Why is it such a, a central theme? I would say that it's often the ideological foundation. And even in the title of the book, white supremacy is woven throughout the God, the guns, and the, and, and the sedition. And this was, I think, a conscious decision made by this movement in the early 1980s that we saw at Charlottesville in the Unite the Right rally or in August 2017. In fact, the evening before the night, the, the Unite the Right rally, uh, the torchlight uh, procession on the UVA campus, where the people, the, you know, the hate mongers carrying these tiki torches, chanting Jews will not replace us. We're not wearing white sheets or we're not wearing brown shirts and Sam, Bel uh, Sam Brown belts, you know, the sort of like Nazi regalia. They were wearing chinos and, and, and polo shirts. And that was exactly the point. The movement understood in the really 1980s that in order to grow, it had to appeal to an increasingly diverse constituency. And it started to move from the pure hate, the racism, the anti-Semitism, the anti-Catholicism, the xenophobia of traditional hate groups where they attired themselves in sheets and, and brown shirts to become much more mainstream and to mix in zealous opposition to any restrictions on gun ownership, Second Amendment rights, strident opposition to legalized abortion in the United States, uh, militant tax resistance, recognition of no form of government above the county level. That all leads to anti-government extremism and sedition, and which culminates, of course, on January 6, 2021. So there's the white supremacist kernel there, but it's something that's become much bigger. And uh, we argue in the book deliberately so, because that's how they appeal to a broader and more diverse constituency. One thing, Catherine, that is really important to touch on is a conspiracy theory called Great Replacement Theory. We talk about this in the book because it's inspired a lot of the modern white supremacist attacks that we've seen. So whether you're looking at Pittsburgh, El Paso, Charleston, Buffalo, Christchurch, and I could go on, they were inspired by this conspiracy theory. Great Replacement Theory argues that there is a deliberate replacement of white people, white masculinity, white westernness, that's being operationalized through immigration and minority political rights and LGBTQ plus rights, but that it's being deliberately coordinated by Marxists, by Jews, by feminists. This conspiracy theory is so dangerous in part because of that big tent, regardless of which individual minority group you are mobilizing against or you have grievances against, you can find a home under that conspiracy theory. And one of the things that was really interesting for me studying this group, uh, this conspiracy theory, uh, we don't write about it at length in the early days, but I've written about it elsewhere, is the, is the extent to which this truly white supremacist conspiracy theory has shape-shifted over the years. One of the historical examples of this is actually Frederick Douglass and his final speech that was posthumously published talked about the reasons why black men in the South were being lynched by groups like the KKK. And he gave three justifications. He said, black men are lynched because of accusations of race riots. Black men are lynched because of accusations of rapes of white women. And black men are lynched because they're being accused of diluting the vote. This was in the Reconstruction era, right after the Civil War. And the amazing and frightening thing is that those three justifications can still be found in white supremacist manifestos today, even if it targets Jews or immigrants, or black people, or, or Muslims, or other immigrants, they are still using those same justifications. So I think that kind of shows you how powerful this conspiracy theory has been, how woven it, in, how woven in it is, not just to far-right extremism, to, but to the American story writ large, and also how big the fight is for us to try to, to, try to unweave it from the American story. I also, in your chapter, Armed and Dangerous, you, you talk about the re revival of the KKK at the start of the 20th century. Tell us that story. What were the main differences between the Reconstruction era KKK and that of the 1910s and 20s? And what sparked this resurgence of the Klan's popularity? Well, this pivots off, off your last question when I responded and said, you know, all terrorist movements everywhere are always searching for new constituencies because otherwise they can't survive. 
And that's very much the story of the Ku Klux Klan when it was founded in 1865 in Pulaski, Tennessee. It was basically all about uh, resisting the occupation of, of the southern states by federal troops by the north and also about re-enslaving and terrorizing the recently freed slaves and re-enslaving them in another form of, of, of repression. So it had a very narrow and racist character and it died out. I mean, it died out, as we detail in the book, largely because of the efforts of the uh, Ulysses S. Grant administration. That's, in fact, the Justice Department was created to enforce the Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871, amongst two other uh, legislative initiatives to suppress terrorism in the United States, although that term wasn't, wasn't really used then. Um, and the Klan disappeared. It's revived in the beginning of the 20th century, um, for several reasons. I mean, firstly, there's uh, epic, historically um, path-breaking film called Birth of a Nation that based on a not very good novel called The Klansman by Thomas Dixon that was pretty much ignored, but much like today when something is put on the screen and attracts a, a wider following. So this regenerated in 1915 interest in the Klan, exactly as Jacob just des described this great replacement theory, becoming a tool for repression of all peoples. A Jewish superintendent of a pencil factory in Georgia named Leo Frank was accused of murdering a 14-year-old uh, white Christian girl and uh, subsequently, to make a long story short, uh, was lynched, publicly lynched. Postcards of that lynching were readily available. There wasn't social media back then, but postcards of Leo Frank being lynched were widely circulated. So you have two modern communications platforms, uh, the cinema, even though it was the silent silent films then, and then just uh, you know photographs that were now being could be mass produced and sold very cheaply. And then you have someone who, um, was not very successful, William Simons, at any other vocation he had embarked upon, but had been able to make money by enlisting people in economically driven commercial types of social activities, getting people to join social groups that had some economic basis. And he hits upon the idea of reviving the Klan, but opening its aperture, expanding it beyond just racism, and newly freed slaves, or in the early 20th century, more, uh, more recently uh, released slaves, and making it anti-Semitic, so anti-Jewish, and anti-specifically Jewish immigration from Eastern Europe, anti-Catholic, specifically against Catholics emigrating from Italy and Sicily. I mean, this is part of you know the immigration that was transforming the United States in the 1890s in the early part of the 20th century. Anti-Asian, and this all culminates in attracting far more people than the Klan had ever attracted right after the Civil War. In fact, the Ku Klux Klan becomes more popular north of the Mason-Dixon line than in the states of the, in the 11 states of the Confederacy. It has four to five million members. Indiana, Ohio, and Pennsylvania were the three states that had the largest Klan membership. It had more members in urban areas than in rural areas of the South. So all of our preconceptions about the Klan are turned on its head. It becomes extremely popular, plays a leading role in the presidential primaries or the presidential conventions of both the Republican and Democratic parties in 1924, helps elect governors, senators, uh, representatives uh, in the House, mayors, aldermen, and so on. A future president of the United States, Harry S. Truman, joins the Klan in, in Missouri, for example. And the extent of its power is demonstrated in the Klan's successful lobbying for the enactment of the 1924 Immigration Act that actually remains in force for 41 years and is only repealed under the administration of President Lyndon Baines Johnson as part of the civil rights reforms that we saw following the assassination of President John F. Kennedy that LBJ now takes as a mandate to implement. And that's when this Immigration Act is finally repealed in 1965. So the Klan was enormously influential. Fortunately, the period we're writing about, it becomes much less influential, but the people who understand parading around in white sheets. And by the way, there was a very famous parade down Pennsylvania Avenue also in the mid-1920s of at least 10,000 Klansmen, for example. That era is now superseded by people, as I said, appealing you know, 
by wearing suits or wearing khakis and polo shirts. And maybe not, it's not marketed as the Ku Klux Klan, but it's very much, just as Jacob described, the great replacement theory gaining new traction and new adherence from the 1980s up until the present. Yeah, absolutely. So I don't know if we have time to get into it in, in a lot of detail, but this chapter uh, delves into two major incursions right-wing terrorist groups or right-wing groups had with law enforcement, one of which was Ruby Ridge and the other one was the Waco siege. But then the next chapter kind of signals a shift into what you guys call the leaderless resistance strategy. What is the strategy and how has it changed right-wing groups' approach to terrorism? In 1988, a significant trial occurred in a place called Fort Smith, Arkansas, where the U.S. government actually tried to bring 14 white supremacists to trial on a charge called seditious conspiracy. Right? The idea being these white supremacists and anti-government extremists intend to overthrow the United States government. All 14 of those individuals were acquitted. There were certain elements of the trial that were brought into disrepute. For example, a couple of the defendants ended up marrying a couple of the jurors. But anyway, one of the one of the leaders of the movement, and he'd been a significant figure for a while, a KKK uh, leader from Texas called Lewis Bean, decides basically, or has this revelation that uh, the movement was very close to having basically every head of the Hydra cut off with nothing uh, left behind. So uh, he kind of moves underground starts writing this uh, newsletter called The Seditionist. And in 1992, he revives an old World War II era uh, system of insurgency and terrorist organizing called leaderless resistance. The idea being, if we organize publicly, if we organize in groups, if we organize with leaders, we are going to leave ourselves vulnerable to government infiltration, as almost happened at Fort Smith, and or as did happen at Fort Smith, and we'll leave ourselves open to prosecution and the destruction of the movement as always, almost happened at Fort Smith. Leaderless resistance as a strategy leads to small cell and lone act of violence. And effectively, that's what we've seen for the, for the bulk of the past 30 years. Almost all the acts of far-right terrorism that we've seen from Oklahoma City through Atlanta, through Charleston and Pittsburgh, and all the other incidents I mentioned have involved either true lone actors operating alone or or very small cells. And as the movement has proved, this kind of organizing makes counterterrorism very difficult because the elements of a plot that you would usually try to interdict, whether it's financing or training or leadership or communications, those don't exist anymore. And they don't reveal themselves to law enforcement often until the plot is over. One of the interesting elements about January 6th is that groups did organize publicly. They did reveal their presence. They did kind of wear markers of their organizing. And several leaders of the movement were charged and prosecuted on those seditious conspiracy charges that the government had failed with in 1988. I think the jury is still out, in, including among Bruce and I, about how much of an impact that's going to have on the movement. Because there's an argument that, of course, these groups get driven underground and move back to leaderless resistance. So, you know, the question is whether that's a deterrent against the groups and will leave us safer. Or does that proof of concept of leaderless resistance as being a, a more effective measure actually do the opposite, right? Lead to more danger because these individuals have gone back underground and haven't revealed themselves any, aren't going to reveal themselves anymore. So the, a leaderless resistance is a very effective, very dangerous mode of organizing, and we have never really found a good response to it. Let what Jacob said sink in, at least in my from my perspective, two of the most consequential trends in terrorism of the 21st century, one of which Jacob's just been talking about, leaderless resistance, which we also call lone actor violence or lone wolf violence, and also terrorist uh, radicalization and recruitment over digital media. Both of them had their origins in this movement in the 1983-1984 time period, and both of them date back to the same individual that we've been talking about almost throughout the interview, Louis Beam, Vietnam veteran, two tours in Vietnam as a helicopter door gunner, Grand Dragon of the Texas Ku Klux Klan, architect of the leaderless resistance strategy, and then 
Similarly, the way he de developed that or articulated that as a way to frustrate law enforcement penetration of actual organizations or, or groups. Similarly, he came up with the idea of using, um, back then it wasn't digital technology or media. It was actually, you know, very cumbersome desktop computers with about 48K memory, which is about a numeral or a letter on a PowerPoint slide today, using things called modems. You know, if anybody's seen the film, you've got mail. It was that weird sound when you dialed up. But he developed basically a means of radicalization and recruitment using very primitive form of com computers. But nonetheless, I mean, that's what has been harnessed by terrorist groups throughout the world, by Al Qaeda, by ISIS, especially by this movement we're talking about today. In the 21st century, they did not originate in the Middle East or in South Asia from the terrorist groups we've been focused on for the past 20 years, but in the United States 40 years ago. And that underscores this, continu this depressing continuity that we see in the book. I'm glad you brought up social media because I wanted to ask about that next. How has kind of the shift from, as you described, I, I don't know, I don't want to use the word primitive, but more simple technology to what we have now um, with various social media platforms affect these movements? How do far right terrorist groups or how do these lone actors, if they're not parts of groups, use social media, appear on social media, organize? How does that work? Social media is now the front line, the battlefield of modern uh, domestic terrorism, has been for at least a decade. I think social media has really had two main accomplishments. The first is it has lowered the barriers to entry to radicalization. In prior eras of extremism, you typically dealt with people who were very much committed to the cause, had read up you know, on Mein Kampf and the Turner Diaries, really understood the ideology. Now, it seems often that the extremism is more of an ideological veneer on top of other personal grievances. Some of the cases that we talk about over the past few years, of course, great replacement theory, of course, accelerationism play large roles in the ideology and the strategy, but you're often dealing with people with mental health issues. You're often dealing with victims of bullying, with ideology being more of a secondary element to that. Radical groups and radical networks can now project influence all the way into bedrooms or living rooms, and they can circumvent, violate some of those guardrails that were placed around people, and that has introduced more people to extremism. We see that with QAnon, for example, which is a mass, an, an example of mass radicalization on a scale that is almost unimaginable. Millions of people buying into conspiracy theories that claim that their neighbors are blood drinking, Satan worshiping pedophiles. That is the impact of social media. The other element that I think is important is uh, there's been tactical shifts. So in a lone actor era where groups are less important, uh, where extremists tend to be a lot younger, we're seeing fewer complex plots. So the kind of explosive attacks that struck Oklahoma City and Atlanta in the 90s have been replaced by mass shooting attacks, typically targeting soft targets, including places of worship and supermarkets. So the tactical barriers to entry have also been overcome. And I think that is partly what's, con what's contributing to, to this particularly frightening moment. We're facing a landscape with a large number of extremists radicalizing at will with easy access to firearms and with an almost unlimited number of potential targets in you know, multiracial, multireligious democracy. That is a wicked brew, and that has contributed to the acts of violence that we've seen. Something I noticed while reading the book and included in the kind of the excerpts of the manifestos of the various terrorists that you've included was their language, a lot about gaming and internet memes. Uh, they use the word shit posting a lot. They're using such seemingly unserious tactics to mobilize and spread their message. Is that just to make it more palatable or spreadable to people who maybe, you know, are looking for a sense of belonging and somehow find a far right group rather than like a pickleball organization in their community? You know, it's 
It's one of the developments in the movement that is both very upsetting and also very perplexing for a couple of old men like Bruce and I to try to get our hands around. <laughs> we, you're right. You see it in the language. We call this development gamification. You see it in the language with things like ship posting. You see it in the platforms that that individuals are using to radicalize places like Discord, right, which is a gaming chat platform. The most frightening place where you see it is in some of the language used in manifestos and also in an even more upsetting development, which is the terrorist live stream. Manifestos now frequently call for new terrorists to set a high score. And I'm putting that in quotation marks. That is the language that they use. You should see from that language that there's almost a dehumanizing. There is definitely a dehumanizing, but also a demystifying of killing. Some of the manifestos even include almost a list of targets, number of points for killing this race of people, this religion, this political orientation, points for the ways that you can kill them with a firearm, with a gun, with a car. The idea being that after this particular attack is over, somebody else is going to be able to tot up this individual's high score and then go out and try to beat it. I think that connects both to the social media element, of course, and the legal assistance element and that thing I mentioned very briefly, which is terrorism getting younger. So a lot of these cases involve people who are radicalizing in their teenage years or in their early adulthood, and, uh, and that's appealing to them for whatever reason. The even more upsetting part, though, Catherine, is the terrorist live stream. Multiple of the incidents that we've seen over the past you know, five years have involved GoPro cameras basically that are fixed on somebody's chest or helmet and videotape and live stream the, the mass murder of, of, of civilians. And these videos are horrendous. But I'll just tell you, as somebody who unfortunately has had to see them, they really do look like video games. And again, I think that contributes to this dehumanizing of victims the mystifying of the act of killing and almost opening the the aperture to the next person to say, you know what, this isn't that crazy of a thing to do because you've done it your whole life in these video games. That's the gamification and it's a really, a really difficult challenge to, to know how to deal with. It's horrifying. So let's switch gears a little bit and talk about Donald Trump. More broadly, what is it about Donald Trump that directly appeals to far-right terrorist groups? And how did Trump's campaign and election mobilize them? Well, that's one of the biggest differences between the 1980s and today, and one of the more depressing ones, is that back in the 1980s, we're talking about a movement that was very disparate, that was geographically diffuse, that was only very tenuously connected and tenuously even then with with technology that was novel and pioneering at the time, but was still very difficult. To, I mean, it was almost impossible really to, to communicate visually, especially, but also in, in, in real, real, real time. But the main difference was that it had absolutely no resonance in mainstream politics. This was a complete not only fringe, beyond the fringe, it was a complete extremist movement at the very far, almost untouchable reaches of the political spectrum. And what's been so depressing in recent years is that it's gained increasing top cover by mainstream politicians who have not hesitated to say the same kinds of things that you read in these manifestos and propaganda, the poisoning of the blood of Americans is, that we've heard in recent uh, uh, days, in fact, is, is, is an example of that. But we know empirically, I mean, this is not just uh, an opinion. We know empirically that when President Trump said a uh, day after the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia, in August 2017, that there were good people on both sides, that was taken as a green light by extremists on the right who thought they were getting top cover, that they were getting the presidential imprimatur. I mean, this is enormously powerful. And it breathed life into the movement. Um, similarly, when President Trump at the first uh, presidential debate in September 2020 said to the Proud Boys, uh, stand back and stand by, 
that was taken as this ringing endorsement. I mean, we know this from their communications, both internally that have been released as part of the seditious conspiracy trial, but also their external communications, their exaltation on social media that, wow, the president called us out. Uh, the president gave us a shout out, in essence, that this served as very a very powerful incentive and message. And we saw what it led to on the tragedy on January 6th and that when our democratic system was, was almost overturned. So words matter. And certainly what we've seen is more and more mainstream politicians gravitate into this space. And let's be clear, this isn't only about, you know, targeting Democrats or targeting progressives or the, the, the left on the cover of our book is that gallows in front of the, the U.S. Capitol on January 6th that was meant for a sitting vice president of the United States who is a Christian evangelical Republican as well. It's, it's, it's directed internally, too, and this is extremely worrisome. Just recently, a Senate candidate in Missouri, for example, um, had a, uh, a campaign commercial about going out and hunting rhinos. And I'm not talking about the, um, the animal, but Republicans in name only and talks about, you know, a hunting license to just, you know, willfully go out and, and, and target them. And this is, you know, enormously disconcerting when violent or violent sentiments enter into the mainstream. And it goes back to your previous question about things that are said with a, a wink and a nod that we're only joking type of, I mean, that's part of the message too, but it's not joking. I mean, words matter and they're meant perhaps to inspire others who may not have these kinds of guardrails to actually go out and commit violence. Yeah. It kind of gave them the sense like this is okay. What we're doing is okay. And the big guy supports us. So let's go out and do it more. And that is still the narrative, Catherine. One of the things that I think has been a real issue after January 6th, especially now that we're in an election year again, has been that the deterrent against that kind of activism, again, a violent overthrow of our seat of democracy, violence against police officers that resulted in suicides and other fatalities. One of the issues is the deterrence has been erased by some of the rhetoric calling January 6th defendants hostages or political prisoners. That's not an effective way of trying to ensure that this kind of violence does not emerge again. In fact, it's the exact opposite. Again, it's offering top cover. It's encouraging people to conduct similar attacks. And as we approach another contentious election, we've, we've lost the deterrent on more activity like January 6th. This might be oversimplified, but do you think we're heading into 2024 do you think we're in a better, worse, or the same position that we were in 2020 when it comes to far-right terrorism? Let me make a perhaps controversial proposition, Catherine, and say that I think we were lucky on January 6th. And I'm not just talking about the fact that you know, no, no right has got their hands on any political leaders, which would certainly have arrest, uh, resulted in assassination, most likely. But that the movement, the, f the violent fringe didn't realize that they were in an emergency situation in their eyes until after the election. I don't think that's the case this time around. So in 2020, we had the election on, I think the election was called on November 7th. So they had about two and a half months with which to respond in violence. This time we have primaries, we have conventions, we have the vote itself. We have all those other dates like January 6th. Perhaps even more seriously, though, we have court dates. And the court dates are being used to fuel this narrative of victimhood and martyrdom that extremists thrive off. And so I think we're in a worse situation than we were in, in 2020 and 2021. I think we're entering a fraught year in which violence is, is sadly almost certain, and yet it's very hard to predict who the targets will be, where it will occur, when it will occur, and that's very troubling. And I would add, think about the two pipe bombs that were discovered on January 6th in front of the Republican National Committee and the Democratic National Committee. We have to understand that this kind of extremism, this kind of onslaught against democracy is nonpartisan. I mean, it affects both parties, potentially. And what worries me the most is that at least on January 6th, some of the adversaries were identifiable. 
in the sense that they wore patches, they waved flags, they belonged to groups or organizations, and in fact, they were prosecuted accordingly. That's very different now. I mean, after the su successful seditious conspiracy charges brought against nearly two dozen members of the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers, the next round of violence is going to be from persons, I would argue, that are going to burrow deeper underground, that are going to not be part of organized groups with identifiable leaders, with a command and, and control system, but rather they will be p more emblematic, let's say, of the cell that came together that coalesced off of Facebook and plotted to kidnap uh, the governor of Michigan, uh, Gretchen Whitmer. That when you just have a handful of people that make it very difficult for law enforcement and for the authorities to track and identify. Absolutely. I want to give you guys a chance to explain your policy recommendations for you know how we address this. But before we do, I wanted to touch on something I found it very interesting, which was the phenomenon of veterans joining the far right terrorist groups. So I just wanted to ask why why are these groups so attractive to those with a military background? This is a story, Catherine, that weaves its way through our book, the, the relationship between the violent far right and the US military. Really, you can break the relationship down into three buckets, right? You have the people who radicalized before their service and sought to enter the military for training or to recruit radicalize other service members. You have people who radicalize when they're in the military. So they radicalize during their active duty. And then you have those who radicalize as veterans for whatever reason, sometimes decades later, and might weaponize, might use their military skills in, in weapons or you know, communications or insurgency, counterinsurgency against the government and against you know, their communities. This is one area where Bruce and I try to correct a misconception in our society where I think in part because of the Biden administration's measures here, often there's this narrative that has emerged that the military is radicalizing people and causing there to be a threat against the American community, American communities. The kind of flagship administration countermeasure, for example, has been a military stand down where they've basically encouraged, you know, units to stand down over the course of 60 days to talk about extremism. This proved very controversial, pretty largely ineffective based on conversations that, that people have had, that we've had with, with service members. And it was kind of, it's kind of whipped up into the culture wars as being part of, you know, arguments that said the military is woke and, and all this. As you rightly point out in your question, we find that overwhelmingly the issue is actually to do with veterans, uh, mostly veterans who have come back from combat abroad. Why that's the case, I think, is, is less clear. Certainly, post-traumatic stress disorder has played a large role in a number of these cases. Lewis Beam, the individual Bruce mentioned before, we quote him in the book as explaining the fact that he never got, he felt he never got back from Vietnam. He was never able to escape his experiences in Vietnam. I think PTSD goes hand in hand with grievances against the government, both of being abandoned during service and also being abandoned by veterans administration on, on their return. And I think, you know, elements of the military mindset. Soldiers have to have a mindset of it's our team, my guys against them, against their guys. And I think that's hard to shake. And sometimes that's manifested itself in, in white supremacy, frankly, because when you have that mindset, that very zero-sum polarizing worldview, and you can't deprogram yourself from it, it leads to you making divisions in your own life, in your society that are very harmful. Um, so we call for more efforts at the veterans level and also on screening to try to protect the military from, from those infiltrations. We don't really argue for the kind of measures the Biden administration has taken in trying to you know, solve extremism in the ranks because our data doesn't really show that to be as much of an issue. So your book concludes with a really, really well-researched and extensive detailed set of policy recommendations split up into three prongs, short, medium, and long-term. I know we can't, you know, dive into the entire chapter as deeply as I would probably like, but could you 
briefly explain each approach in a nutshell? Well, we talk about things that we can do now that would strengthen the regulatory environment that would have an immediate impact. Uh, this, of course, assumes less of a divisiveness and polarization that currently exists in Congress. But we talk about the need for domestic terrorism legislation as part of an effort to bring greater equity in sentencing, but uh, also to um, ensure against recidivism because we're seeing problems in that respect as well. We talk about reform of Section 230, the Communications Decency Act, which would exercise greater control over social, social media and make them more accountable for the content on their, pla on their platforms. We then talk about, uh, and again, this is a brief out outline, the, 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 giving you a sample of things that can help to rebuild civil society and strengthen uh, resilience that would have a, an effect over the next five to 10 years. And in this context, uh, we talk about really uh, digital and media literacy, uh, beginning efforts that would enable people to find information sources that really do have expertise that actually are true. I mean, one of the problems that we've identified is that people are getting their news increasingly from social media platforms and even from social influencers, rather than, let's say, from bona fide journalists uh, who have to provide multiple sources, whose information is often fact-checked, who then are subjected to, to editing. And the Biden administration has indeed talked about in enhancing and improving digital um, and media literacy. We just think that this has to be redoubled, that there have to be serious efforts uh, championed by the Department of Education that begins at schools, in civics and, and social studies classes as well. And then we talk about, I mean, something very mundane, but that we feel very strongly about is extending broadband throughout the United States. Uh, for example, 25% of rural areas in America still have to rely on dial-up. That same technology that Lewis Beam was harnessing in 1984 is basically the kind of technology they're left with. Whereas by comparison, only about 1.5% of metropolitan urban areas don't have access to broadband. And this was one of the wedges that the Ku Klux Klan used in the, 20, in the 1920s in its own onslaught against expertise and against scientific knowledge, which also sounds particularly familiar uh, given you know, some of the responses to the COVID lockdown and even vaccinations in, in recent years. So we talk about extending as, a, as just a good, but also opening people to better sources of information. And then we talk about really all of these things coming together with a generational change in the longer term, in the next 15 to 20 years, uh, that push back against the hatred and intolerance that we've seen being harnessed by social media. Um, but that also can act as a counter to the cycle of recruitment and regeneration that has sustained these movements that talk about great replacement theory and that use hatred and intolerance, racism, anti-Semitism, xenophobia, um, opposition to legalized abortion, anti-LGBTQ, that begins to reshape this new generation. And this is enormously important because when you think about it, young people today are getting their information from arguably from less reliable media sources, and they're going to be the future leaders. I mean, we're going to have people coming into government, coming into positions of influence and authority, whether they're captains of industry or whether they're journalists themselves, that have learned very different approaches to information than are necessary to really counter what we see is um, less reliable, less expert platforms. So to wrap, I just wanted to ask, what is your, a two-pronged question, what is your biggest takeaway from your time spent writing the book? And what message would you like readers to take away after reading it? I'll jump in first and say uh, the biggest takeaway I have from writing the book was something very personal and how absolutely wonderful an experience it was to write a book with someone that's four decades younger than you, because <laughs> I really think that we had to bring two different perspectives to something that's historical and contemporary. And to make the book work as it did, you needed that breadth of experience, and but also the fresh perspective and the very different perspective that a younger person has. Um, so that was that's my takeaway. The message of the book 
all but two of the chapters of the book begin with quotes of, from the Turner Diaries to underscore how its anti-government sentiment has woven itself into the fabric of discourse in the United States today. The one chapter that doesn't have a Turner Diaries quote is about January 6th and the power of social media when someone's exclaiming, we're overthrowing the government and they're broadcasting it live. But for me, the real message comes in the policy recommendation, the epigraph in the policy recommendations chapter where we go back to Ronald Reagan's acceptance uh, speech at his inauguration as governor of California in 1969, where he warns how freedom is a very precious commodity that we're only a generation away from losing and how it's something we have to guard zealously because he makes the point, once freedom and democracy are lost, it's never regained. And that sounded kind of like a nostrum up until January 6, 2021, and especially coming from a conservative Republican. Um, the inspiration, the avatar of, of conservatism in America, that to me was such an important and timely warning to begin that chapter. It was something that we found very very much towards the end of writing the book. And I came across it and I thought, gosh, this is exactly what we're talking about in this policy recommendations chapter. So that to me is the biggest takeaway that people should uh, derive from reading the book. Well, first of all, let me echo everything Bruce said, because otherwise I'll get in trouble. It was a great experience <laughs> writing with him as well. I would make a, I'll make a controversial point, uh, but one I feel really strongly about, and that is absent environmental factors the greatest threat to the United States as a country and to Americans as a people comes from ourselves and our conspiracy theories and the way that we are so willing to divide each other, hate each other, and use violence against each other. Because some of these conspiracy theories play on demographic trends like immigration, for example, that are a reality. And if we can't get to a place as a, as a nation and as a people where we learn to love those who are different from us, care for those who are suffering, uh, realize that we're stronger together than we are so divided. We will not just corrode ourselves, but if we ever do end up in a serious national security situation like a great power war, we will not have the unity, the strength, the pride to fight that conflict. And so we are in an imminent emergency, in my opinion, based on conspiracy theories like Great Replacement Theory, QAnon, that really exist on hatred and polarization. So my advice would be, parents, talk to your children about, about these things. And children, Gen Z and Gen Alpha, take control. You're going to be the people who are seeing us into this new era, into this new world. Build the world that you want to see and make it, for me, make it one that is, uh, is welcoming, is open, is built on love and not hatred. And if we can do that and we can place our faith in, in our younger generation, we will, be, we will be okay. I really believe that. And on that note, Bruce and Jacob, thank you so much for joining me. I learned so much. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Catherine. You're very welcome, Catherine. Thanks so much for having us. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. You can get ad-free versions of this and other Lawfare Podcasts by becoming a Lawfare Material supporter through our website, lawfaremedia.org support. You'll also get access to special events and other content available only to our supporters. Please rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts. Look out for our other podcasts, including Rational Security, Chatter, Allies, and The Aftermath, our latest Lawfare Presents podcast series on the government's response to January 6th. Check out our written work at lawfaremedia.org. The podcast is edited by Jen Patya, and your audio engineer this episode was Noam Osband of Goat Rodeo. Our music is performed by Sophia Yan. And as always, thank you for listening.